everybody. Welcome back to our notes. Today we are going to be talking about the periodic table. We are going to be recapping a little bit of the quick history of the periodic table and who founded it and why it's organized the way it is. Check out this next video clip from Crash Course Chemistry, but watch carefully. The subtitles at the bottom will help you fill in your notes. Make sure you're listening and enjoy. That's one reason why Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev became the crown jewel of Russian science and a theorist who revolutionized how we see the world. Mendeleev spent a great deal of time in laboratories as a student studying the burgeoning new field of chemistry. He worked with all the elements that you could work with at the time and his knowledge gave him unique insights into their properties. Those insights would come in handy. Let's all imagine we're Mendeleev again. I, I like doing that. And, and that we know a bunch of stuff about chemistry, which, you know, you don't yet. Yet! But we're imagining. So it's the 1860s, and about 60 elements are known to mankind, and their atomic weights are mostly known as well. So the simplest thing was just to sort them in order of their atomic weights. But interestingly, you, because you're clever pants, realized that the most significant relationships seemed to have nothing to do with the atomic weight. Lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium were all extremely prone to reacting with chlorine, fluorine, iodine, and bromine. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and strontium were all similar but less reactive. But with a quick inspection, you, and to be fair, a number of other chemists, realized that there was a relationship between atomic weights, but it's periodic. At the beginning of the list of elements, characteristics repeat every seven elements. On a side here, we now know that it's every eight elements, but in the 1860s, elements were studied based on their reactivity, so the non reactive active noble gases had not yet been discovered, so the period occurred every seven elements. As the mass of the elements increases, the repetition starts to look a little less periodic, though it's certainly still there, it just isn't perfect. Some of your colleagues, they're saying, well, such is life. It was perfect repetition early on, but later in the list it gets a little fuzzier. But not you. You become obsessed. Obsessed with the perfection of the periodicity. You write out the names and weights and properties of elements on cards. You lay them across your desk, shuffle them, tear them to pieces in frustration until one day you realize that you're simply missing cards. The numbers aren't working, not because there's something wrong with your ideas, but because some elements simply haven't been discovered yet. Armed with this insight, you insert gaps into the table, and things suddenly fall perfectly into place. So, so our modern periodic table is actually based on Mendeleev's ideas. So let's check out this clip to see how our modern periodic table is structured based on all of, all of his research from a long time ago. As you move from the light elements to the heavy elements, you keep periodically coming across the same properties, which is why it's called the periodic table. The recurring properties are organized so that you can easily see similarities between elements. The periodic table is arranged in periods and groups, going from the light elements at the top to the heavy elements at the bottom. The rows going across from left to right are periods. Elements in the same period all share something in common. They have the same number of energy shells. Each new period row represents a new shell. Elements in the first period have one shell, and as we go down, the shells increase. Hydrogen is in the first period. It has one shell. Potassium is in the fourth period and has four energy shells, as do all the other elements in this period. The columns going down from top to bottom are the groups. Elements in the same group also have something in common. Elements in the same group have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell. The electrons in the outer shell are called the valence electrons, this just means that these are the electrons available for reactions and bond formation. The number of electrons in the outer shell governs elements' reactivity, which is why elements in the same group have similar properties. The group number can tell you how many electrons are in this shell. For example, let's look at group 7. Fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine and acetine. They all have 7 electrons in their outermost shell and all exhibit similar chemical characteristics. The properties show a gradual change going down the group as we go from period to period. 
So if we look at group 7 again, we can see that they are each in a different period in the periodic table, telling us that each element in this group has its outer electrons on a different shell. So chlorine is in group 7, period 3. Therefore, it has three energy levels with seven electrons in its outermost shell. All right. So let's talk about what we just saw in debrief. Our modern periodic table, again, is based on Mendeleev's ideas. The elements are all sequentially based by atomic number. Remember, the periodic table goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the atomic number that you see. This atomic number is how many protons, which are positively charged particles, are in the atom. By the way, this number also matches how many electrons, remember, negatively charged particles. This number increases as you move across the periodic table to the right. These arrows, or these across rows, are called periods. So the rows that go across are called periods. The vertical columns that go down the table have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell, or their valence shell. These down rows are called groups. So to recap, when you're looking at the periodic table, going across are the periods, and down are the groups. Now that we know how the periodic table is arranged, it's very important to look at some of those groupings, some of those, what we call them, element families, and see what exactly they have in common. Our Mendeleev, master of the elements. Okay, we're done imagining for the episode. That was fun, though. The different groups Mendeleev had identified are a lot of the same groups that we study today. Starting at the left, we have the soft, shiny, extremely reactive alkali metals. So reactive, in fact, that they have to be stored in inert gases or oil to prevent them from reacting with the atmosphere. Alkali metals want nothing more than to dump off an electron and form a positive ion or cation. And they're always jonesing to hook up with a hottie from the other side of the table. So, of course, seeing as they're so reactive, you don't find hunks of them lying around in nature. Instead, chemists must extract them from compounds containing them. Next, you have the alkaline earth metals. Reactive metals, but not as reactive as the alkali metals, forming cations with two positive charges instead of just one. Calcium, shown here, undergoes a very similar reaction to sodium and water, just a little more slowly, producing a little less heat. The middle body area of the table is made up of a nice solid rectangle of transition metals. These are the metals you think of as metals, with iron and nickel and gold and platinum. The majority of elements are metals. They're fairly unreactive, great conductors of heat, but more importantly for us, good conductors of electricity. They're malleable and can be bent and formed and hammered into sheets, and they're extremely important in chemistry, but overall surprisingly similar to each other. On the far right, just over from the noble gases, the halogens make up a set of extremely reactive gases that form negative ions or anions with one negative charge and love to react with the alkali and alkaline earth metals. The rectangle between the halogens and the transition metals contain a peculiar scatter shot of metals, metalloids, gases, and nonmetals. These guys don't end up as ions unless you take extreme action and start shooting other ions at them. So generally, a bit boring over here, though lots of interesting covalent organic chemistry. We'll get to that. Down below, in their own little island, are the lanthanides and actinides, metals that were largely undiscovered in Mendeleev's day because they're so similar that it's next to impossible to separate them from each other. And finally, on the far, far right, also undiscovered when Mendeleev built his chart, the completely unreactive noble gases. Like a lot of other obsessive scientists, Mendeleev never thought he was done with his table, so he held it back for quite a while, only publishing it as part of a new chemistry textbook he was working on as a way to make some quick cash that he needed. And as Okay, so let's recap what we just learned from that video clip about element families. Let's start with the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals. Remember, these are very, very reactive. They are found over on the left-hand side of the periodic table. They can easily lose that one outer valence electron. Remember, they only have one or two, and they easily want to give them up or share them. These items are very, very good conductors of both electricity and heat because they're so reactive. 
Remember, keep in mind that alkali metals are rarely found just lying around in nature because of how reactive they are. If we want to get them in their purest form, they have to be extracted from some sort of compound. The halogens, moving over to the right side of the periodic table, they react also very easily because they're looking to gain an electron. So over here in period, or excuse me, it's in group number 7, or 17, they react very easily because they want to get an electron. And then finally over in group 18, the very last group on the right hand side of the periodic table are the noble gases. They are very stable because they have a complete valence outer electron shell. They don't want to take, they don't want to give up, and they don't react very much at all. On the back of these notes, you're going to find a periodic table that I would like you to please color code. So make sure you take the time to go back, re-watch the video you just saw, the video clip about the different element families, and then also use this as your guide to color your own periodic table. You don't have to use the same colors, however, you need to make sure that your key matches your periodic table. Last but not least, let's talk about how we read the periodic table. How we read those different element codes or those different symbols that we see on the periodic table. The atomic symbol is that one or two letter abbreviation you're going to see from either the English, the Latin, or the, some sort of Greek derivative name. The name you see is the common name, what we call it commonly. The atomic number at the top, remember that number tells you how many protons there are as well as the number of electrons. When we are making our Bohr models, this number is very important. Another number we'll talk about a little bit this year as we're getting started in chemistry is the atomic mass. The atomic mass is a decimal number for a lot of the different elements because it's the weighted average of the masses of all of the elements' isotopes. An isotope is atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons, depending on if it's giving or taking electrons. We'll talk more about that later. So that's the atomic mass. Well, thanks for listening and paying attention once more, and here is your explosive video of the day.